Okay, well, uh, it's great symposium. Thank you for organizing it. And it's really great to be participating in this 50 year celebration. Um, I also wanted to just mention at the beginning how much I appreciate uh, Helen and more recently Steve's involving me in the PDB and different activities. It's really been great uh, interest for me and great for my, my, uh, uh, my career. And uh, also John Markley and Jeff Ho for their involvement in the BMRB. Uh, so this is a required uh, disclosure that I'm an advisor to Nixomics, a structural bi biology CRO. So my, um, my uh, research program has always been very collaborative. It's always been very interactive. And I tried always to see how a structure, three-dimensional structures and dynamics can impact a broad range of biology. And uh, these are actually some of, the, some of the collaborations at Rutgers, which have resulted in PDB depositions. So not just from my lab, but also from, from my collaborators. And um, I really appreciate having these collaborations over the years. So I want to describe um, two lessons that have come from my experience in structural biology. Uh, the first is this concept that the structure encodes function that structural similarity is preserved over longer evolutionary distances than sequence similarity. And, and this uh, lesson really came in one of my earlier collaborations with Masuri Inouye on this protein, a uh, cold shock protein. So when you cold shock, when you reduce the temperature in bacteria, they stop growing and uh, they start producing some proteins and they overproduce this particular small protein called the cold shock protein. And uh, uh, Masseri brought this to me to see whether we could use somehow structural information to inform, uh, to inform the biology. And what we saw was this structure. And what you see is uh, this array of uh, aromatic rings on the surface uh, that are strongly conserved in the family. And it made us think that perhaps this was a nucleic acid binding protein. And what you see the red colors there are the, are the chemical shift perturbations that occur when you bind to single strand nucleic acids, in this case, single strand DNA, but also single strand RNA. Um, and we also recognize that this protein had structural similarity with classes of class of proteins, a range of proteins, all of which were single strand nucleic acid binding proteins. And as it turns out, the protein acts as an RNA chaperone. When you cold shock bacteria, there's actually another protein that produces an RNA helicase. And the double strand RNA forms hairpins it forms duplexes, uh, secondary structures that are disrupted by the helicase and then maintained in an open state by the chaperone, the cold shock protein, which binds non-specifically and not too tightly. And this, this prevents the cold shock from preventing the RNA from being translated by the ribosome. So that biology story evolved from this. So this was this concept that, that structural similarity or looking at structures could give you clues even when sequence similarity might not quite get you there. And um, this particularly uh, was uh, illuminated to me by work by, by Chris Sander, who developed a DALI uh, structural database search where you could see structural similarity of these obviously functionally similar proteins. So, so this thinking uh, led uh, Steve Anderson and I to propose to the New Jersey Commission on Science and Technology um, a program in what we called structural bioinformatics. I hadn't heard the term before that, um, although it's an obvious term. And among other things, we organized a meeting uh, in Avalon, New Jersey and brought together, you'll recognize many of these people, uh, uh, Eddie Arnold and Helen Berman and, and, uh, and uh, um, Steve, Stephen Burley. And these people from NIH and NSF and DOE, like John Malt and others, and from this actually evolved this concept of a structural genomics initiative. And uh, so this is actually the, uh, the dogma of molecular biology, the basic tenets of molecular biology, the DNA sequence uh, is transcribed to RNA and the RNA to protein. And we can do that. We know the rules for that. But it's not the protein sequence, which is the functioning thing. It's actually the three-dimensional structure. And so that process we call protein folding and nucleic acid folding. And the challenge is how do you go from these sequences to the 3D structures? And obviously it's by, has been by experimental structure determination. So the aim of the PSI program was to get 
make the three-dimensional atomic level structures of most proteins easily available from knowledge of their sequences. And, and the concept was to determine enough structures that you could use those structures, the basis one way in or another of modeling all of the protein structures from that. So that was the vision that evolved. Um, and this actually just summarizes some of the work we did at Rutgers. You recognize some of the names of the scientists who work on the, worked on this project. We, in NESG, we had both uh, NMR and X-ray crystallography. Um, at the peak, we were depositing something like uh, 45 structures a month. That's uh, more than two structures a day into the PDB. Uh, and at the, so for a total of about 1,200 structures or 1,300 by the time everything was done. And uh, at these little, these little circles here, these nodes in the graph represent collaborative interactions. This is the NESG node. And one of the things we were particularly good at was collaborative community outreach activities, very much in the model of, of the way the PDB works in that way of being very uh, outreach, community outreach. Um, but of course, fast forward to uh, about a year ago, and we have these tremendous results from AlphaFold. Um, I've been part of the CASP assessment over the last uh, eight years, actually, looking at different aspects of this. And what we see is remarkable ability to, to, to predict protein structures, which really is the, the vision of the PSI and really is very much enabled by the database, the protein data bank of structures, and the novel structures that were generated in the PSI program, which particularly focused on getting structural structures of proteins, for which there are no homologous proteins with homologous structures available. And uh, it's really quite impressive, the alpha fold that in the lower right is a, is a model of uh, an integrase that I've been working on with Monica Roth. Um, we have individual structures of pieces. Uh, this is now the alpha fold to prediction of the whole um, integrase structure, um, which we are now trying to validate by various experiments. In the lower left is an example of an NMR structure, oops, uh, where uh, AlphaFold2 is compared, it's a blind uh, comparison. Actually for 96 targets, the average GDT score was about 90%, which is less than one inch from RMSD for the background. As Stephen mentioned this before. So fast uh, coming to, to work we've been doing most recently, uh, I, I think most people are familiar with this picture. This is the idea of uh, infection by coronavirus. Coronavirus produces a large polyprotein. The polyprotein is then cut into, into fragments, into non-structural proteins by two proteases that are encoded, the PL protease and the 3CL protease. Um, and concept is that inhibitors of these could be very effective as antivirals. And in fact, Pfizer will soon be releasing the first antivirals of the 3CL protease uh, for emergency use. Um, so in the, in the COVID, uh, as the COVID epidemic evolved, we thought, could our structural genomics think, our structural bioinformatics thinking enable this? Um, so here we, we did a dolly search with the uh, hepatitis C virus, sorry, with the 3CL protease and we identify homologs, other proteases, like the hepatitis C virus uh, protease. And this is showing the, the, uh, the, the, the st striking similarity of the core of the protein of the substrate binding site. And you can see actually the active site residues just superimposed, even though one is a serine protease, the other is a cysteine protease. There's almost no sequence identity. And in fact, these have very different topologies. They have similar secondary structures, but the way they're connected is very different. And this led us to the idea that perhaps some of these known inhibitors of the hepatitis C virus protease could also be inhibitors of the, uh, the 3CL, the main MPRO, main protease. So we, we obtained these drugs. Uh, these are prescription drugs. And we started by doing docking experiments. We weren't allowed to be in the lab at that time. And we found that some of them docked very nicely into the active site of the, of the SARS coronavirus. And in the lower left is an example. This is a docking model in pink by Kushbu, my, a postdoc in my group. And subsequent to this, after we put the paper out as a, as a, a chem archive preprint, uh, Andy Messicart deposited the structure shown in green into the PDB. It's a remarkable match. Uh, and actually this is just showing how this Boca Prevere binds uh, into uh, MPRO or into NS, into the 
uh, hepatitis C virus protease in a very similar docking mode. Um, so doing this, we actually identified several hepatitis C virus proteases, which docked well into the active site uh, of uh, the main pro, M pro. This, third, this score here, 13B, is a known inhibitor. It's not a drug. It's a very good inhibitor. You can characterize. And some of these have better binding scores than 13B. And then finally, we got in the lab. We made the protein, and we started doing uh, inhibition experiments. And indeed, we find that these inhibit with, with uh, up to as high as 20 micromolar, but as low as one or two micromolar uh, IC50s. We identified seven of these hepatitis C virus drugs that are able to inhibit the SARS of coronavirus. We then contacted uh, a friends at, at, at Mount Sinai and initiated uh, viral inhibition assays. And we see here is the ability of these drugs to inhibit the virus. And this is in green monkey cell, Vero cells. Uh, seven of them inhibit with IC50s less than 20 micromolar um, with little uh, cytotoxicity. It's also been done in human cells and also in CHO cells. And we've characterized uh, that several of these are inhibitors of the, of the, of the coronavirus itself in, in, in cell culture. But we saw something kind of interesting. We started mixing these drugs together, the hepatitis C virus drugs, together with remdesivir in combination assays. And you can see for bocaprevir, there's not much gain by adding bocaprevir in terms of the inhibition by remdesivir or adding remdesivir in terms of the inhibition by bocaprevir. The effects are additive. We can make these kind of plots, and when they're flat, that's an additive interaction. But you see these other ones, we can get 10 to 20-fold enhancement of the inhibition of, these, of, of, of remdesivir in the presence of small amounts of these hepatitis C virus drugs. And this is shown in these kind of plots. These, uh, these coming up, that's, a, that's an, uh, a synergistic interaction. Going down, that would be an antagonistic interaction. So we, we were not sure what was going on. So we started to consider that perhaps these drugs were also inhibiting the second protease, PL pro. So we explored this first by docking. We found good docking scores, and then by inhibition assays and what, of the enzyme. What we found is that the drugs that inhibit PL pro are the ones that actually are synergistic. So some of the drugs that inhibit M pro are not synergistic, but others are, and those are ones that inhibit. PL pro. We want to have to study this more by identifying very specific uh, PL pro in inhibitors here. Compound six is synergistic, whereas those that, um, that, that only inhibit the M pro are not synergistic. So the bottom line here is that there are these two proteases. Some of the hepatitis C virus drugs bind and inhibit M pro and inhibit the virus. Others also bind PL pro. And those that bind PL pro and inhibit PL pro, they can fun function synergistically. And now we've identified other PL pro inhibitors that also function synergistically. So that was kind of I wanted to tell how our structural genomics, our bioinformatics thinking, led us into this kind of work, um, which I think we're very excited, which we're very excited about and continuing. Um, but then the, the other lesson that I want to illustrate that we learned is that. Proteins live on a conformational energy landscape. That basically proteins are not single structures, but they interconvert amongst multiple states. And this is a fundamental part of their function. It's certainly part of the function of the two proteases I just talked about. Um, so this is a project that we, a paper, a project we recently published together with Monica Roth, a collaboration. So these are BRD3 proteins, BRD3 proteins, which are uh, epigenetic regulating proteins. And they are, they are targets of the murine leukemia virus integrase, which has a C-terminal peptide segment that binds to so-called ET domain. And in binding to the ET domain, that directs the gene integration. There are also host proteins that have uh, segments, polypeptide segments, disordered segments that also bind to the ET domain. So together with uh, Monica and, and Swapna, we determine structures of these complexes. And what you see, they form similar kind of complexes. This is the peptide binding. This NMR spectrum shows disorder to order transition upon the peptide binding. But you see they bind in very different orientations. In this one, the beta strands go up and down. In this case, they're going down and then up. 
we have this plasticity of this binding site that allows different kinds of binding modes. We actually spent about a year and a half, maybe two years on that project. And then we tried alpha fold. And amazingly enough, as you can see here, the alpha fold was able to dock these peptides into the right side on the protein with the right binding conformation. So this is a, an example of actually doing disorder to order peptide binding with alpha fold. Another feature of this interaction is when the integrase protein, for example, binds to the, uh, to the host protein, to, to, to the uh, BRD3, it forms this uh, hairpin structure binding in, but it creates a linker. It creates a linker, and uh, this linker causes the situation where we have flexibility of one domain with respect to the other. So actually, this is an active area of investigation. This linker actually has a lot of sequence conservations of prolines and serines, and we think there's a stiffness of the linker. That it's not just that complete flexibility is important, but having just the right degree of flexibility. So I want to illustrate two more two more examples of this, uh, the role of dynamics. So this is the, this is the uh, dengue virus protease. We and Janssen had tried to crystallize this protein without success. It's been very difficult to get crystals. And one reason is you have to make a complex between a large disordered region uh, and, 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 and an ordered region, and that makes the whole thing more ordered. Um, so Gawa Liu was able to actually solve this structure by NMR, determine the structure, bound to an inhibitor, and this is a covalent inhibitor that binds at the serine active site. But the remarkable thing is he could see NOEs between two regions of the protein, NOEs to this region and NOEs to this region. And because these NOEs were inconsistent, he could separate them. And in this way, he could determine two structures from the same sample. It's actually one single PDB entry. We actually used NMR nuclear relaxation measurements to measure rates of conformational interchange between states. And assuming the two states, they interconvert at about 400 times per second, well, relative populations are approximately equal of those two forms. So I made this morph, and morph is just a, a way to show that there are two conformations, the two ground states. It doesn't show how you go from one state to the other. But the concept I tried to illustrate here is this protein structure is not a protein structure. It's this distribution of structures. And the binding site is not a single binding site. It's a, it's a multiple binding sites. Um, so as we've evolving our thinking, we've been looking at evolutionary covariants and using evolutionary covariants for modeling proteins, especially when we have limited data. And this is a concept that was really brought to fruition by work by um, Debbie Marks and Chris Sander, Jose Anunchuk, Martin White. Uh, this is actually breakthrough in being able to reliably identify contexts by sequence covariance and using that to actually generate models of protein structures. What we've been focusing on is the idea that the sequence covariance will not only occur for the single structure, it will occur for the multiple conformational states of the protein that both conformational states, if they're functionally important, should give rise to ECs. And we can use those ECs to learn about the alternative conformational states. So we developed a tool we call ECNMR. It's automatic NMR data analysis guided by ECs, uh, where we take NOCI spectra together with ECs and chemical shifts and generate structures. And we've used this to generate good quality structures of large deuterated proteins, which would otherwise be difficult to get the structure by solution anymore. So proteins up to about 40 or 50 kilodalton, uh, we combine the EC data. When we combine the EC with the NMR, we get RMSDs to about two angstrom to the right structure. Uh, but when we have ECs alone or NMR data alone, the structures are less accurate. Um, so most recently, we've been applying this to membrane proteins because membrane proteins have particularly Time to wrap interesting up, conformational dynamics. It's one more slide. Thank you, Steve. Um, and uh, uh, as you see here, this is the ECNMR structure of this MIP-A. It's actually a drug transport protein. This protein, um, in, in our NMR structures, we get two kinds of structures. One has this loop in and one has the loop popped out. And when the loop is popped out, it actually causes the, the channel to be open in the protein. So this is actually a morph of this. On the left side, you see this is actually the two 
confirmations that are coming out of our calculations, both of those forms are supported by evolutionary covariance data. There's evolutionary covariance data for the two forms. And what you see is that as the loop pops in, if you look at it from the bottom on the right, the, the channel is open. And when the loop pops out, the channel is closed. So this uh, requires still additional uh, validation and, and leads to additional experiments. So in conclusion, there are these two lessons that have come from my experience, first at Rutgers and now more recently at RPI. Structures and code function and structural similarity preserved over longer evolutionary distances than sequence similarity and give clues to function. And now with AlphaFold 2, we're doing that on large sets of proteins. Uh, and the second lesson is that proteins live in a conformational energy landscape, and that's critical for understanding how they work. And so with that, I just want to thank, I mentioned people as I went along, we have a great collaboration still with Monica Roth, Chris Sander, Bob Krug, and, and uh, Garcia Sastra. And uh, just mentioned that um, we, we have openings for postdocs who are interested in this kind of work of looking at dynamic uh, protein structures and combining computational and bioinformatics methods with, uh, with, with experimental data. So thank you, thank you.